For today's video, we're repairing a Comptometer Model 993S key driven electromechanical adding machine made in the UK in the 1960s. This machine is actually a Bell Punch Model 912VZS, or alternatively, it could be referred to as a Sumlock 912VZS. The Bell Punch Company bought the rights to the Comptometer name sometime around 1960 from Felton Tarrant, who made the original Comptometers like this early Model B from the 1990s. Bell Punch rebranded their Sumlock key driven machines as Comptometers once they'd purchased the Comptometer name. So now we step back in time to when the machine first arrived. There are a few keys stuck down, and all of the other columns are locked in the up position. The number wheels are jumbled up, and it looks like the machine is stuck part way through a cycle. If I try using the clearing lever, it does absolutely nothing to clear the display. And also, the lever to add into the upper storage register is stuck in the subtract position. So we'll take a look inside and start the process of freeing everything off. It's fairly normal for the oil to get thick and sticky with age, causing everything to stop working. The case is held on by four screws on the underside, one in each corner. And with the four screws removed, the machine can be sat back on its feet, the clearing lever knob taken off, and then the cover can carefully be removed, revealing the mechanism inside. And immediately I can see a problem. This little bit of plastic is a pin off one of the carry wheels in the register. Under normal circumstances these won't break off, but someone has obviously attempted to run the machine while it was jammed, causing the pin to break. Then I found a second broken pin, and later on another too. The pins should be on each pair of gears that do the carrying from one column to another. You can see it a bit clearer on this shot, there's a pin broken off here, which should look like this gear to the right. These gears are common amongst most of the bell punch and some lock machines, so I'll need to get a donor machine for some spare parts. Another problem I didn't spot at the time is that some of the carry springs located between the two gears have been wound beyond their capacity. This usually couldn't happen, but without the pins the gears can simply continue turning without carrying the number onto the next column. The first thing to come off is the keyboard cover plate, which is held in place with four screws. So I'll get these undone, and then off comes the cover plate. Normally the next thing to come off would be this cover plate over the number wheels. There's a little plate on each side that has to come off first, and then like all the Sumlock and Bell Punch machines, you need to slide the number wheel axle pin to the side to remove the plate, but as the wheels are seized onto the axle, it won't budge, which makes life a little more tricky. So, with what little access I have, I'll carefully carry a drop of oil on the end of a screwdriver to the side of each number wheel, so it'll reach the axle pin, and then I'll leave that to soften the old oil while I get on with some other parts of the machine. In the meantime, I may as well vacuum away some of the dirt and grime from the keyboard, because it's pretty horrible in here. It's not that unusual for little carpet moths to lay their eggs in the felt in these machines, and you'll sometimes find the cases left behind by the grubs. So while we're doing the vacuuming, I'll remove the mechanism from the base plate. Just above the power socket, there's the earth connection to the chassis that simply pulls out. And then on the right hand side is the multi-pin socket for the remaining electrical connections, which again simply pulls out. And now the mechanism can be lifted off the base plate, making sure you're lifting by parts of the chassis rather than the mechanism itself. This leaves us with the wiring and the electrical suppression box, which we'll talk about a bit more later in the video. I'll just quickly vacuum the base of the machine, and true to form, there were a couple of carpet moth grub cases in here, so I might put a mothball in the bottom for good measure. The chassis rails of the mechanism sit on these shaped rubber blocks to isolate vibrations. These blocks tend to be a bit perished, 
but they're serviceable enough on this machine, so I'll leave them alone for now. And now I've got the mechanism sitting upside down so I can start adding a drop of fresh sewing machine oil to every moving part and then one by one start to free everything off. And while I'm working on the underside I can try to disconnect the number wheels from the drive motor. Each of these sections represents one column of numbers and if I turn the motor by hand you can see that they're all trying to move but if I pull this part backwards it should latch in the disengaged position. So we'll give that a try and yeah some of them are sticking but I'm left with just three columns that have stuck so I'll turn the number wheel gently at the same time and yep now I can get the remaining three to latch in the disengaged position. So now I should hopefully be able to manually return the number wheels to zero. They're sticky but mostly moving and there's still this one that won't move and you can see by the way that some of the other wheels are moving when I rock this one that it's seized to the axle pin. Right, I've now managed to zero the remaining wheel. The column before it was stuck trying to carry, which was preventing this wheel from turning. It's still seized to the axle, so I still can't remove the cover plate, but I'll just get on with something else for a bit and return to this later. It was at this point in time that another, more or less identical machine turned up to use for spare parts. This spare parts machine was also completely seized, but it had no damaged parts inside, so the rest of this video will actually be working on the second machine rather than the first one that you've seen so far. I won't show the entire process of freeing up the machine because pretty much every moving part was either tight or jammed solid. These rollers on the racks that move to do the actual adding are a good example. They were all solid, so I added a drop of oil to each side of each roller. One or two could then be freed by just giving them a tweak with a pair of pliers, but most of them needed a little heat to soften the old sticky oil. I didn't video the heating process, but as on other videos I used Penelope Pitstop's hairdryer, also known as an embossing heat gun. These give a really nice controllable heat with less risk of heating parts you don't want to heat, such as plastic parts. And after the heating process, and working the roller backwards and forwards a few times to circulate the fresh oil, we now have a freed off roller. OK, I've made some progress freeing off most of the number wheels and some of the adding mechanism. If I press a 1 in this column and turn the motor by hand, it adds into the register just as it should do. If I now press a 5 and again turn the motor, that also adds into the register. And the next column is also working. And the next one too. And the next one as well. But then we get to one that isn't working yet, so I'll flip the machine over and show what the problem is. The number racks on the underside have a spring-loaded sliding section, which you can see moving here. If I press a little further, you'll see the rest of the rack moving as well. And now if I move to the non-working column, the sliding section isn't moving at all, and just the entire rack moves if I press it a little harder. And now if I press the number one key on the working column, you'll see the rack shoot upwards, and the sliding section strikes the base of the number one key right at the top of the screen. This is how it sets what number will be added into the register. If I press the number one key on the non-working column, it moves a little bit, but it doesn't get anywhere near the base of the number key. And looking a bit further back on the number racks, you can see these spring-loaded levers, these are the things that actually apply the tension to the sliding section. And now if I move to the non-working column, the lever will barely move, and once I have managed to move it, it won't return to its original position. So now I need to go away and uh, free all this lot up. OK, now we've skipped forwards in time, and all of the mechanical parts of the machine are now working. 
I finally managed to free off the last seized number wheel and then I could remove the number wheel cover plate. To do this you need to carefully slide the axle to one side but only just enough to release the cover, any further and parts of the register can start to fall out. Then you push the axle back through and repeat the process for the other side of the cover plate. I then usually use a spare axle pin with a wipe of sewing machine oil on it and carefully press the first axle out, replacing it with the spare axle. You have to make sure you keep a little bit of pressure on the axle you're removing because if the two axles separate during this process, parts of the number wheels can fall off. I'll then clean the original axle and apply a light coat of oil to it and then replace it in the same way that I removed it. Often doing this will free up all of the wheels, but in this case I also had to clean the axle for the intermediate gears behind. Having fixed all the mechanical issues, it was time to have a look at the electrical parts. Here we have the centrifugal governor contacts with the motor switch contacts below. Both sets of contacts were gummed up and stuck shut and had to be freed off and cleaned. On the end of the motor shaft there are some spring-loaded weights that fly outwards as the motor speeds up, pushing this pin which presses this lever to open the contacts. The motor then slows down a little and the contacts close again. This process will happen very fast and repeatedly, keeping the motor at a constant speed. There's also a second pin with an adjustable spring pushing back in the other direction. This one is to fine-tune the motor speed. The fine-tuning pin was also stuck and that section had to be stripped and cleaned before it would work correctly. Looking at the motor contacts below, if I press a number on the keyboard you'll see the contact close, which would start the motor up. Then once the number has been added the contacts will open again and the motor will stop. The newer machines had a separate micro switch mounted on the side frame to start and stop the motor, rather than being part of the governor assembly like it is on this one, but it still worked in the same manner. The machine was fitted with an old style power socket, which I didn't have the cable for, so I made a bracket and fitted a standard C13 socket, which uses a readily available C13 power lead like this one. When I checked the rest of the wiring I found that the internal fuse had blown, and on further investigation there was a dead short between live and neutral on the suppressor box. So here's the suppressor box which had a dead short between the neutral and live terminals, and if I flip it over this capacitor was fitted between those two terminals, and as you can probably see it's failed emitting smoke and goop over the inside of the box. If I now bring in the suppressor box from the other machine, the components are slightly different but it's fundamentally the same, and this one also has a failed capacitor causing a dead short across live and neutral. If we take a look at the box, live and neutral come in here with a capacitor across the supply. It then passes through an inductor, then there's an identical capacitor on the other side of the inductor, and the wires go off to the rest of the box, and in turn the motor and the governor. Also on the output of the inductor are two capacitors going back to earth. These are purely to reduce electrical noise. Modern thinking would use class Y capacitors for this job, because if the current capacitors to earth failed in a shorted state, the case of the machine would become live. Class Y capacitors are designed to fail open circuit to prevent the risk of an electric shock. It's slightly different on the older machine because there's some weird dual capacitor with three legs, but again it should really be a class Y to be safe. So I've got myself some replacement components and I'd better get soldering. And here's the last bit of soldering. I didn't need to replace the resistors because the old ones on this machine were fine. I will replace them on the other one because some of them had obviously got hot and were fairly charred. The machine uses an old size of internal fuse that I couldn't get hold of, so I'll need to replace the fuse holder itself. The replacement is a little bit bigger, so I'll have to check that it clears the mechanism before fitting it. 
and here's the new fuse holder in position. There's plenty of space so I can call that job done. So now for the moment of truth. Will it explode? Well, it didn't explode, but I did hear a slight fizzing sound, so I'll need to investigate that. OK, after a bit of diagnosis, it was the Class Y capacitors back to earth that were fizzing. I'm not sure why yet, maybe the ones I got weren't suitable for the configuration I was using. Anyway, I've removed them for now. They are just for noise suppression after all. I'll deal with them properly at some point in time, but for now we have a fully functional machine. So let's try the machine out. If I add 999 plus 1234 plus 1812, it'll give us the answer 4045. If I now press the plus button here, it'll add that into the upper register and clear the lower register ready for some more calculations. If I now add 737 plus 911 plus 2029 plus 326, it'll give us the answer 4003. If I now press the minus button here, it'll subtract that from the upper register, leaving us with the answer, as always, of 42. I'll save the full demonstration for part two. I'll put a link to that video in the description once I've filmed it, probably in a week or two. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to click on the bell icon so you'll get notifications when future videos are released. Anyway, that's about it for now, so thanks for watching and I'll see you in a future video.